All right, so I'm really pleased to welcome Matt Stevens uh, as his keynote speaker today. So Matt Stevens is a PhD from Modeling College at Oxford, where his advisor was Brian Ripley, who I'm sure some of you even still know as a core member of the R project and author of much of its statistical modeling code and a frequent uh, contributor on the R help list. Anyway, Matt then went on to do a postdoc with Peter Donnelly at the University of Oxford. And this is, this is where he developed the structure uh, program together with uh, Jonathan Pritchard, a widely used uh, computer program for determining population structure and estimating individual admixture. And he then also went on to develop the, the influential Lee and Stevens model as an efficient model for, for linkage disequilibrium. Now currently he's a professor at the departments of human genetics and statistics at the University of Chicago. And I guess he's best known for his sharp insights into statistics and clarity of thoughts and presentation, and also for his infectious humor. So I'm looking really forward uh, to hearing some of that. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for having me. Let me just see if I can. OK. Oh, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> nice uh, reactions going up my screen. <laughs> I don't know if you can all see them. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and it's a party, so it's rather rather appropriate. Um, so a word about the title, I guess it was about seven years ago now I started talking about multiple testing and I was fed up with people talking about the multiple testing burden when I thought there was a multiple testing opportunity. So I was I, I started talking to people about this multiple testing opportunity and then I read a blog post by Joe Pickrell where he said, Kind of made similar points and said we need we need to stop talking about a burden we need to have a multiple testing party and i thought well that's a that's a much better title for a, for a talk and uh so that's what i've started hanging it hanging on the multiple testing party but if you prefer it's really a multiple testing opportunity so i'm going to talk about the op opportunities to do with multiple testing um okay so uh just to like you know, if you're going to have a party, you have to prepare. So let's just prepare for the party. I, I'm going to, you, if you're going to enjoy this party, you're going to need lots of tests because, uh, well, that's what multiple testing is about. And you're going to need something. They're going to have to kind of be similar to one another in some sense. And so my motivating applications come from genomics, where we're testing lots of genes or, th or, or SNPs or something like this that are all kind of somewhat have something in common. And so the tests are kind of have something similar to one another, which justifies using them to learn about one another in some sense. So that's what you're going to need to enjoy that party. So there are some maybe multiple testing scenarios where this kind of thing wouldn't apply, but that's the kind of scenario I'm looking at. And I argue that in this setting, it isn't the number of tests that matters, it's the results of the tests that matter. So I want to kind of uh, talk you through that idea first in a very simple setting. So this is uh, just supposed to be a histogram of the distribution of p-values from a lot of tests. So let's suppose we've tested 10,000 genes or 1,000 genes or a lot of genes uh, for uh, differential expression, let's say, between two groups. And we've got a p-value for each. And we've plotted a histogram of the p-values. And here's what this histogram looks like. And what I'm going to talk you through is what the uh, R package Q value by John Story, which I think is on Bioconductor and has probably been one of its top hits for a, for a decade or more now, probably two, moving on to two decades. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk you through how Q value graphically, what Q value kind of does when it gets a distribution of P values like this. Uh, so what it does essentially is it tries to decompose these this histogram into uh, two groups, a set of p-values that are uniform, uh, and another distribution, kind of the rest of them, that are non-uniform. So the uniform ones are the ones that come from the null tests, uh, ostensibly, and the rest of them are potentially the ones that come from the alternative tests. So the way it does that is essentially it looks at the right-hand side of that histogram near, near 1, yeah, and it looks there and it says, how high is the distribution there? And it draws a roughly, tries to guess how high it is there and draws a horizontal line to represent the uniform uh, part of the distribution. The idea being that if there were more 
uh, null tests, that that this that that point near one would be higher, right? The, basically, the height of the p-values near one is kind of a upper bound on how many null tests you could have, how high that uniform component of this histogram could be. And then it says, okay, so the rest of them are kind of the rest, what's left when you've subtracted that uniform distribution is, think of that as the alternative distribution of the p-value. So I've colored them in dark blue and light blue here, or cyan. And, um, and then at any given p-value threshold, I've drawn a red line here to represent some kind of threshold, we can ask, what's the false discovery rate, we can try to estimate that. And we can do that by taking the area uh, B here, which is the dark blue area to the left of the red line, and divide that by the total area to the left of the red line, which is A plus B. And in this case, that's 13%. So that would be an estimate of the false discovery rate um, at that p-value of here, 0.1 p-value threshold. So essentially, that's what q-value does, and it assigns a, 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 a q-value to each p-value, which is essentially this FDR estimate at that, at the, if you use that p-value, is it threshold? So the q-value corresponding to 0.1 here would be 0.13. So that's what q-value does. And as you can see, I think it doesn't really matter how many tests there are here. At least, you know, there's just got to be enough that there's a histogram that is reasonably estimated. It, I, you know, we don't know, actually, I can't even remember whether I simulated 1,000 or 10,000 p-values here, but it doesn't matter. It's the distribution of the p-values that matters. And the reason it doesn't matter when you're estimating a false discovery rate is that the false discovery rate is a ratio of the number of false discoveries divided by the total number of discoveries. And as all other things being equal, as you increase the number of tests, both those numbers increase linearly and uh, in expectation, at least. And so the false discovery rate doesn't actually depend on the number of tests. It's an expectation. So essentially, it doesn't depend on the number of tests. OK, so there's my um, explanation for you know, what it's not. You shouldn't think about multiple testing as kind of a problem with number of tests, but with the results of the tests. It's the results of the tests that matter. And in this case, if there were a very uniform distribution of p-values, you would get a very high false discovery rate. And if you have a very non-uniform distribution of p-values with lots of p-values near zero, you'll get a very low false discovery rate at, at, at that threshold. So it's not the number of tests that matters, it's the results of the tests. And furthermore, these tests are not a really a burden, but an opportunity to learn. The way I think of this is that actually we're using that distribution of p-values from the histogram to learn about essentially the signal to noise ratio in the set of tests that we're looking at and therefore make an informed decision about what thresholds make sense because a false discovery rate is a much more interpretable uh, quantity than you know, choosing a, trying to choose a p-value threshold. Really, you know, it's easy easier to think about choosing an FDR threshold than a p-value threshold. OK, so is that the end of the talk? Um, well, how, that was the main point of the talk, is it's not the number of tests. It's it's what their re results that matter. But of course, I'm hoping that we, we can use that insight to do a lot more than I've just said. So let's uh, let's say, so here's, here's this q-value procedure. This is partitioning the histogram into two groups. I always thought this was an insanely clever idea, very simple, very straightforward, very intuitive, very happy with this, until I saw this plot. So this plot is, I've just plotted those p-values in z-score space. So in, mostly in genomics, we, well, many times, p-values come from z-scores. So uh, let's just transform the p-values back to the z-scores that that produce those p-values and plot the same plot. This is the same decomposition as before, except I've just plotted the null on top because I want to emphasize the uh, alternative distribution. So the null, again, now in, in z-score space, the null is a normal distribution, a standard normal. So that's the blue, sorry, the dark blue. And the cyan is what's left. And what you can see is that there's no mass in that alternative distribution near zero. And that makes sense because of the way we, in the sense that, you know, we looked at the right, the p-values near one, which are the z-scores near zero, and we said, we could basically assume that all those were null. All the p-values near one are null, which is equivalent to assuming that all the z-scores at zero are null. 
which means that none of the z-scores at zero are alternative, which means essentially that z, a z-score of zero is impossible under the alternative. But, but that's just not true. I mean, uh, because of incomplete power, it would not be at all surprising to see a z-score of zero under the alternative uh, for some tests. And so this distribution uh, under the alternative makes me unhappy. And I think it's actually an unrealistic distribution of z-scores under the alternative. So I want to try and do something about that. And the way we thought about going about that was to directly model, explicitly model, the alternative distribution of p, of, of uh, well, actually, not of the p-values, but the, uh, no, the, sorry, the alternative distribution of effects, g. So g is the distribution of the actual effects. So these are the betas. These are, I'm going to represent these. J is the number of genes. Each gene has some effect that we don't know. We're trying to test whether that effect is zero or not. And they're coming from some distribution of effects. G, which may have a point mass at zero, because maybe many of them are zero. And it has some other distribution for the non-zero ones. And then what we observe is the beta hats. So we observe noisy estimates of these underlying betas. And actually, I haven't put it on the graph, but we also assume that we have a standard error for each of these beta hats. OK, and the idea is that these beta hats tell us something about the betas, of course, <laughs> and that that, in turn, tells us something about this effects distribution g. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the beta hats and their standard errors to estimate g first. So we use these guys here to estimate this distribution up here, taking account of the fact that the beta hats are draws from this distribution plus some noise. And then having estimated this distribution, we're then going to be able to say, think we're going to use essentially a Bayesian argument to use this distribution as a prior on each beta. And we're going to combine that prior with the observed. Sorry, I, I, I'm pointing at things with my mouse, but I think you probably can't see it. So the G at the top, we're going to use the estimated of G at the top and the beta J hat at the bottom to, to get a posterior distribution for beta J for each J. So this is an empirical Bayes approach to multiple testing. It's called empirical Bayes because the G is thought of as a quote of prior, but it's being estimated from the data. So it's a two-step procedure where step one is estimate G from the beta hats, and step two is do inference for beta J, combining the information from G or G hat and beta hat J. And that, uh, Oh, actually, sorry, one of the references is missing here. Actually, this idea of using empirical Bayes to multiple testing dates back to um, Duncan Thomas in 1985. So it predates even you know, the FDR ideas of Benjamin and Hochberg, um, and, uh, but has been maybe most strongly popularized in, uh, in practice in the recent decades by Efren. And I have a paper in 2017 where I describe the stuff that I'm doing telling you about here today or some of it. OK, so in math, if you prefer math, the idea is we have a beta hat. Given beta hat is a noisy estimate of beta, uh, normally distributed with some standard error, sj. I'm going to call sj the standard error. And the beta j's come from some distribution g. And what I'm going to assume about g is that it's unimodal at 0. So that's my assumption for G. There are other, we can make other assumptions, but that's all, what I'm going to do is make a non-parametric assumption that G has, it could have a point mass at zero, and then the idea is it, it's unimodal at zero. So effects get let bigger, the bigger the effect, the less common it gets in some sense, <laughs> less, what, less density it has. Maybe. I should be more precise. Um, so, uh, okay, so let me try and, uh, so, so actually this is, this is the uh, this is the decomposition of those z scores that this this approach I call adaptive shrinkage or ash gives you in that example. So what you can see is it's uh, the because of the unimodal assumption, the distribution of the z scores also has to be unimodal, and so you remove that gap in the middle. Essentially, it fills that gap in because of the unimodal assumption. And I believe, and, and the dark blue is still a normal, a standard normal. So I believe this is a more realistic, uh, the, the cyan here is a more reasonable estimate of the potential distribution of the Z scores under the, under the alternative than the one with the hole in the middle where you would never see any zeros under the alternative. And so when you do this, uh, 
well, you know, you, you get more power than Q value, but maybe a more important benefit of the uh, empirical Bayes approach is that you actually also get a shrunken point estimates. So when I say shrunken, I mean that they combine information in the prior to move point estimates towards zero. Uh, essentially, you can think of that also as addressing what people sometimes call the winner's curse, where the significant results tend to be overestimated. So there's a shrinkage here that moves those estimates towards zero. And it also will give you posterior credible intervals for each. So you get you get intervals which are also moved towards zero. So you don't just get an FDR, you get effect size estimates out of this procedure. So that's nice. Um, but if I'm honest, I think the benefits of this procedure are somewhat modest uh, in practice. Um, and it's also a, more sensitive than, at least than Benjamin Hochberg, to correlations between tests. So you do have to be a bit careful. Um, there are some benefits, but there are also some downsides. Where I think this, um, this kind of idea actually has more real practical benefit is in multivariate settings. So I'm going to talk about that now, but I just want to pause a moment before I do that to see if there are any questions about the work so far. Right. So, so many people do argue that uh, I, it, you can all see the question, presumably, that, that the alternative distribution should dip at zero. But um, but I don't see any I, I don't see any reason to assume that, in fact. So I take an example for you know, genome wide association studies, let's say, where, um, you know, in the early days when people did small studies, uh, you saw just a few significant effects and they were relatively large because the studies were small and so you had to get um, you had to get a, a big effect in order to get a significant result and then studies got bigger and bigger and as studies got bigger and bigger the you, we found more and more things and this with smaller and smaller effect sizes and essentially the picture that you get as you start to look at these is that the smaller the effect size the more of them there are and and I don't see any reason to think that that will stop as you as you get closer to to zero. I think that the you know I think that quite generically, um, the the smaller the effects you tend to have, the more of them that you tend to see. But I you know, and I I think there's data to support that in GWAS, but maybe not in every setting. The Z score shrinking. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll I'll come back to the. Okay, the z-score shrinking reduces the estimated effect size for estimate underestimated losers as well as overestimated winners, right? Yes, the z-score, the shrinking behavior um, shrinks everything, and it shrinks it depending on what that estimate of g is. So again, the idea, this opportunity I'm talking about, or the, the party, is estimating g, right? It's estimating the signal-to-noise ratio from the data. And the more effects there are, especially the more big effects there are in the data, the less you'll see shrinkage happening. Whereas if the data look like, you know, if the z-scores look standard normal, then essentially you'll shrink everything to zero. So the shrinkage, the amount of shrinkage, uh, just like the FDR depends on the results of the test, the amount of shrinkage depends on the results of the test because the estimated prior, G, depends on the results of the tests. Thank you for the questions. Okay, so I'll talk about the multivariate case now. So in the multivariate case, in each test, so each thing we've tested, so think of a gene, we're gonna test a gene, and we're gonna test it in lots of different conditions. So that would be what I mean by multivariate test, where we've got lots of genes, thousands of genes, and we've tested them in lots of different treatments, for example. Or in this uh, example that I'm gonna show later, we. We're not testing genes, we're testing SNPs. So each test is a SNP. And each SNP is being tested in, in this case, 50 or so tissues. So we've got an estimate of the SNP's effect size and its standard error in 50 tissues. And this, these are cis EQTL, so each SNP is being tested by, to, against a nearby gene. Okay, so 
think of it as a matrix of z scores instead of a vector of z scores you prefer so there's a the rows are the tests and the columns are the conditions or the tissues or it could be it could be anything you got to have multiple tests of for each test you've got multiple tests and they have to be kind of oriented in some ways that it makes it sense to display them as a ma as a matrix and the idea here is that we want to try and exploit the fact that um many effects are shared among conditions. So for example, a SNP that's an EQTL in one tissue will probably be more likely to be an EQTL in another tissue. Sorry, EQTL stands for Expression Quantitative Trait Locus. It's jargon for a SNP that affects gene expression. Okay. Or, or is associated, maybe I should say, a, a SNP that's associated with gene expression. Okay, so I might use that phrase, EQTL. So if it's an EQTL, if it's associated with gene expression in heart, maybe it's also more likely to be associated with gene expression in liver. Okay, so that's what the conditions are. Think of tissues for my example. Uh, but of course, we may also be interested in uh, examples where a genetic variant has a tissue-specific effect because that may tell us something about, for example, what's, what's going on in the reg genetic regulation in that tissue that's different than in other tissues. Maybe it will tell us something about what the cells in that tissue are doing differently. Okay. So, okay, that was the jargon. The GTEx project, if you haven't heard of it, is this very nice big uh, data set on uh, gene expression in about 50 human tissues, lots of samples for each individual. Okay, so this results in millions of tests because there are millions of SNPs in dozens of tissues. So uh, this is a matrix of the z-scores here. It's deliberately kind of washed out because most of the z-scores are null. So you can just about make a faint out a faint background here. That's a, all those null z-scores. And then at the bottom, you can see there are rows of the matrix that seem to have more signal, more red or blue. And in some, you might be able to also see a few rows where there's just one strong z-score. These are z-scores in a heat map re representation. So that represents maybe a potential uh, tissue-specific EQTL or something like that you might think of. So, uh, and if you stare a bit longer, you might see that roughly columns, what, 10 to 20 or that. So there's a group, um, I don't know if you, I don't think you can see my mouse, but around 10 to 20, if you stare closer, you might see that there's a group of rows that seem to maybe be moving together. And those are actually the brain tissues. So there's a subset of tissues that are all different parts of the brain. And indeed, we'll see later that there's a signal in these data that the effects tend to be in, in one brain part of the brain tend to be more similar to other parts of the brain than to other tissues. So this is the data, if you like, the z-scores, the equivalent of that histogram I showed you before. Lots of null things, but also signal and structure in the signal that we'd like to exploit. Okay. Okay, so millions of tests, dozens of tissues. This leads to a horrible multiple testing burden. Oh, no, sorry, that's the wrong slide. Oh. Yes, this leads to a terrific multiple testing opportunity. Yes. So um, we can use this, these patterns, learn about them in order to um, have a multiple testing party. So um, here's this z-score. If I stare at it enough, I've already told you that you know, there seem to be some shared effects, some brain-specific effects, some tissue-specific effects. So we want to learn that from the data. And so essentially the mechanism for doing that is the same as in the univariate case, that there's some distribution of effects that we're going to learn from the data G and the effects that we're, you know, the betas that we don't observe, but we observe beta hats. And, but the beta hats now are a vector and the G is a multivariate distribution. So in my example here, the beta hats are a vector of Beta, of estimated betas for 50 different tissues. So each row of that matrix is a beta hat. And G is a 50 dimensional distribution that I need to estimate. Okay, well, that sounds a little, um, a little tricky. The only 50 dimensional distribution I know that can take account of correlations is, is the multivariate normal distribution in 50. Well, that's not quite true actually. Uh, mixtures of multivariate normals will also work and would be more flexible. So that's what we do. We assume essentially that G is a mixture of multivariate normals, but they're all centered at zero for the same kind of argument that 
um, I made in the univariate case that I think zero is kind of the natural center point for the effects. And that as you get further and further away from zero, the effects that big will become less and less common. So uh, they're mean zero. And uh, there's some parameters here associated with the covariance. Uh, this is a scaling factor, omega L. Sorry, you can't see my mouse. Omega L is a scaling factor and UK is a matrix, in this case, a 50 by 50 matrix for each K that captures some pattern of sharing in the, in the data. So let me just show you uh, one example of, a, of what I mean by a UK. So this is one of the UK, this is one of the UKs we inferred from the uh, data I just showed you. Uh, and the top tissues here are the yellow ones are the brain. So the ones labeled in yellow, the, the tissue, you know, don't need to read every tissue along the diagonal, but the, the one that they're named and the top ones in yellow, where it says testes and then pituitary, and then the next yellow ones are all brain tissues. So what you can see here in this covariance matrix is that there's strong covariance between the brain tissues, also shared somewhat with testes and pituitary. And then there's a whole, you know, all the other tissues also have strong correlations. And then there's still actually a non-zero positive correlation between brain and non-brain tissues. That's this yellow and blue part in the top right, those blocks, but it's less strong. So there's a strong sharing in brain, strong sharing in all the other tissues. And there's also some sharing of effects, correlated effects in the other tissues, uh, sorry, between brain and non-brain tissues. And actually, if you look at whole blood, it's got a little less correlation with everything else. It seems to be a bit of an outlier in this data set. So if that, that, the whole blood is the one just after the brain in, in pinky purple, and the, it, its row is not quite as correlated with the other tissues. And we'll see an example later. Okay, so we'll, you know, I'm not gonna talk about the details about, you have to see the paper to see the details of how we estimate it, but I want to get the intuition across. We're estimating this effect size distribution. Um, from all the data on all the SNPs. And now I'm gonna show you what happens when we combine that estimated prior, the G hat, with the data, the beta hats, so at a given SNP to get posterior intervals and, well, especially posterior intervals. So the left, let me talk through this plot. The left shows the beta hat plus or minus two standard errors in each of the 50 or so tissues for a single SNP. So um, the point estimates are like in a little colored dot and the gray bars show plus or minus two standard errors. And each one of those is one tissue. So the tissues are list, you know, the, the first one I think is testes and pituitary. I think it's the same order as the one I just showed. And then they're the brain tissues and then it's whole blood. And then, so each tissue has a beta hat and a standard error. And I've plotted beta hat plus or two, minus two standard errors. And what you see here is that the effects in the brain tissues, the yellow ones, are bigger than in the other tissues, even the estimates, the beta hats. And But there's a general, and a lot of the other tissues are not kind of nominally significant in the sense that plus or minus two standard errors includes zero, the vertical line. But there's a general tendency that things look like they tend to be positive. The beta hats tend to be positive. So when you combine that information with the prior I've just told you, we've estimated, which wasn't just estimated from this data point, but across by combining information across lots of data points like this one. We learned there's lots of sharing. There's particularly sharing of brain tissues. There's also sharing within the other tissues. Uh, what having combining that prior with these data, you get a posterior where all the brain uh, estimates are that you know they're still they're about the same point, maybe slightly shrunk towards zero, but with much smaller standard errors, um, and that's because it's combining the information across the brain tissues. It knows they tend to have similar effect sizes, so it essentially increases the sam effective sample size for estimating the effect size in brains. And across all the other tissues, you also get kind of a combining effect. And now most of them are kind of nominally or borderline significant, let's say, in the sense that the this plus or minus two standard posterior standard deviations. So these are beta hats plus or minus two posterior standard deviations now um, exclude zero in most cases. Uh, here's another example just where um, this is an example where the beta hat in blood, that's that outlying one, is, is much bigger uh, and more significant than in any other tissue. And essentially what the method has observed is that that's probably an example of a, of a blood specific 
group, although I didn't show you explicitly, the prior has a component in it that kind of picks out some blood specific effects that appear to be in this data. They're rare, but they exist. And when you see a data point like that, even though they're relatively rare, it's pretty clear that this looks like something with a strong blood effect. And so the posterior uh, estimates get shrunken to zero for everything except the, except the blood, which basically stays where it is. So the idea is that the method is learning that prior distribution and then using that prior distribution to improve the inferences across all the tissues, sharing information as appropriate across tissues. Uh, okay, so I promised you a party. Maybe I can give you just some, you know, why, you know, why is it a party? Well, one, one thing you'll get out of this is a lot more significance because of the combining of information across uh, tissues. So just to give you some headline numbers, um, you know, if you just look at one tissue at a time and do a standard FDR type analysis, actually, well, if you, if you just do the empirical Bayes FDR analysis one tissue at a time, you'll get about 13% of the top EQTLs in each gene are significant. But when you combine information across tissues, that goes up to 55%. So what you find is a lot more of the, a lot more of the signals are significant, a lot more of the tissues. The top signals are significant, a lot more of the tissues because um, it's learned that the sharing of effects across tissues. Um, actually, other things are usually more interesting, though, than just that headline number, I think. So <clears throat> maybe I'll just talk briefly now about uh, sharing of EQTLs across tissues. So how much is there? How many tissues are EQTLs shared across? And so usually when biologists and even statisticians are talking about sharing, of effects across tissues they have a, in their mind or ex either explicitly or Im implicitly this idea that there's an effect in some tissues and not in other tissues. But actually, um, you know, that turns out, I think, not to be quite the right way to think about it. Um, for example, if effects are in opposite si signs where there's an, you know, a SNP that increases expression in heart, decreases it in lung, would we really want to call that a shared effect? Uh, I think the answer is no, you would want to it's kind of a different effect, some kind of interaction. And and also, maybe there's an effect that's much, much stronger in blood than in any other tissue. Even though there's an effect everywhere, would you want to call that a shared effect? Well, probably we'd want to know that the effect was much, much stronger in blood. So we introduced some different terminologies and notions of sharing, essentially two. One of them is shared by sign, which is a pretty weak notion of sharing, which is just that we're going to call it shared by sign if the effects have the same sign, not the estimated effects, but the our belief, you know, we're going to try to infer whether the underlying actual effects have the same sign. <coughs> and we're going to call them shared by magnitude if the effect sizes are within a factor of two of one another. You could change a different factor if you prefer, but for our purposes, we had to choose something. So we said if, if the, you know, if the if there's a big effect in blood and then there's another effect that's within a factor of two of it, we'll call that a shared effect. But if it's smaller than a factor of two, it's less than it's half as big, we're going to call that not shared. And what we found was that these different notions of sharing gave completely different pictures in terms of how much sharing there is. So if you just look at sharing by sign, what this is is a histogram of among the top EQTLs, how many tissues share that share that EQTL by sign. So how many specifically have the same sign do we think as the strongest tissue? So we take the strongest the tissue with the strongest effect, strong and, and ask how many of the others have do we think the same sign as that? And what you see there is a histogram skewed towards 40 actually so there were only 44 tissues in this analysis after we excluded some for QC purposes. So I've, although I've been saying 50, uh, there were 44 in this analysis. So it's skewed towards 44. So what you're seeing there is the vast majority of EQTLs are shared across the vast majority of tissues. If you just say, are they the same sign? But if you ask a different question, which is, are they similar in magnitude? You get a completely different histogram, the one on the right, where there's a much more uniform, there's some that are shared by magnitude across all 44, 43, 42, you know, a high number of tissues. And it's pretty uniform with a small increase among the, you know, the one where, which, you know, the tissue specific effects, which have a much bigger magnitude in one tissue than in any other. And then there's a little bump around 10 and that's because there are about 10 brain tissues. And so those are ones which have a similar effect in brain and it's much stronger in brain than in any other tissue. 
Okay. And if you just look pairwise at the tissues for um, how, how, what proportion of EQTLs that, that are present in at least one of the two tissues are shared between those two tissues, and you look by magnitude of effect, you actually get much more kind of, I don't know, high resolution. There's much less sharing by magnitude, but it's also much more similar tissues that are showing that sharing. So if you look here, um, you can still see that brain group um, that actually, sorry, the, there's, they're slightly different orders in this plot. Um, apologize for that. But uh, the brains are the, the first four are testes, liver, uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines, and whole blood. And then the next ones are the, the brain tissues. <laughs> so there's sharing there. But if you look closely, the first two brain tissues, which are the cerebellar tissues, show strong sharing. And then the other eight or so brain tissues show strong sharing. And there's not as much sharing between the cerebellar and non-cerebellar tissues. So that's what I mean by kind of, if you see high resolution uh, signals. If you go further down, the next pair I've highlighted is the skin tissues. So you've got two skin tissues in this data set, sun exposed skin and non-sun exposed skin. And as you could, you might expect that they share a lot of EQTLs and they indeed, that's what you see that they almost all of them have the same mag oh, shared by magnitude where magnitude within a factor of two of one another. And then the next pair is heart. So there's left uh, ve ventricle and the atrial appendage. So those two heart tissues share a lot. Further down, there are small intestine tissues, there are arteries, there are adipose tissues. And at the bottom, there's um, colon and digestive tissues, which also kind of show sharing. And so you can see a lot more kind of biology coming out of this when you look at similarity of effect sizes than you do if you just ask, you know, are they shared by sign? Because the answer to that is, yes, yeah, everything's shared by sign. You know, everything's sharing. But if you look at magnitude, you see only the most biologically closely related or sorry, the biologically very closely related tissues are much more likely to share a similar effect size than less biologically related tissues. Okay, so I just want to warn you to party responsibly. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been telling you there's, you know, there, there's papers out there uh, that say, you know, no need to uh, correct for multiple testing, blah, blah. And I may or may not agree with, with them, but there are definitely issues, right, that arise. And I don't want to argue that they're not issues, these publication bias, p-hacking, p-snooping. There's also unmeasured confounders. As I mentioned, these empirical-based methods can be somewhat sensitive to correlations among tests. So you have to be a bit careful. But I do think it's very hard to imagine doing this kind of thing without having some kind of modeling framework. So we have to so we have to build models, is my belief, to do this kind of thing. And you want those models to be as flexible as, prop, as possible, or at least well, you want them to be sufficiently flexible to capture all sorts of patterns in the data. So that's what we think we've tried to do here. Brief summary then, multiple testing can be an opportunity, not a burden. Actually, if you want to replace multiple testing burden with another phrase, what I really think the burden is, is the needle in the haystack burden. That is, if you're doing lots and lots of tests and you're looking for a needle in the haystack because only one of them is really a signal, then you have to be very stringent about your p-value threshold in order to avoid lots of false discoveries. And that it's not the number of tests, though, that uh, matters there. It's the kind of what proportion of the tests have a signal. It's the signal-to-noise ratio. And not all of our testing set settings have this kind of property that only one out of your million tests have, have an effect. In fact, in genomics, usually we're expecting some non-trivial percentage, not a super high percentage, but non-trivial percentage to have a detectable effect. Um, when a typo here, sorry, the, among phenotypes, when share, assessing the sharing, we need a quantitative approach. So that's this idea that you need to look at the effect sizes. If you just ask, is there an effect in both cases, you tend to get the answer yes. And uh, you know, that might be true, but it's not necessarily that insightful. But yeah, the binary present absence calls can hide a lot of quantitative heterogeneity. So I think that if you can phrase your questions quantitatively rather than is there an effect or is there not an effect, that's a good idea. Just wanted to, since this is a bioconductor conference, I just wanted to add a kind of coda here. Uh, 
to say, you know, as we've been doing this work and other work, we've really started to think hard about the notion of modularity and particularly not only in software development, but modularity of statistical analysis. So most statistical analyses in uh, biological settings do not involve a single piece of software, but they involve pipelines. They, you know, so what you really need to do is think of, well, what are the key elements of that pipeline and how is our method going to fit into it? And how can we design our method so its inputs are sufficiently flexible that can be fit into lots of pipelines? So here, you know, the input essentially to the method is a matrix of estimated effects beta hat and their corresponding standard errors, a matrix of corresponding standard errors. And the output is an estimate of the prior distribution G and the posterior distributions or the posterior intervals or the posterior means and posterior standard deviations, uh, some measure of significance for each test. But so that may sound kind of blindingly obvious the way I've presented it, but I want to you know, point out that each of those beta hats and standard errors itself came from some other analysis, possibly a logistic regression, possibly a generalized linear model, of some other kind, possibly just standard linear regression, possibly a limmer with some Bayesian shrinkage of the variances and some correcting for confounders and stuff. But as long as the beta hats and the standard errors satisfy at least approximately that beta hat is normally distributed about the true value of beta with plus or minus two standard, well, normally distributed with standard error, standard deviation S, then you can plug that into this uh, software, this algorithm, and get out the posterior. So the, the point here is we haven't written a different thing for logistic regression, for linear models, for mixed models, all these things. And of course, there's some kind of trade-off there, right? We've we've made some approximations, et cetera. We have, you know, we've made a normal approximation for beta hat of a logistic regression when we do that. But I think that's the kind of assumption that's pretty reasonable for a lot of settings. And by making it very modular like this, it really is really very powerful idea for making it more broadly applicable. Um, yeah, so to thank the people who did the work, particularly Sarah Herbert, Gao Wang, and Peter Carbonetto. And uh, I haven't got the paper reference, but if you want to read about the multivariate multiple testing, it's Herbert et al. 2019 on my website. Um, and uh, I want to thank the people who funded this research, especially GTEC, the NHGRI, and the Moore Foundation. And if you're interested in some of the software, the MASHR is a multivariate adaptive shrinkage, which I, we use to produce the final set of results. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Matt. A lot of clapping going on on the screen. I guess we can uh, just display the, the top questions on the screen. Sure. There's one by... Okay, this is more like a comment than a question by Simina, but this is about uh, how, I guess it boils down to how many tests do you need until it's multiple tests? Yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, good. So, my claim is that the in the univariate case, you could apply our approach to one test, <laughs> and it will still give you reasonable results. Uh, of course, more tests is better. Um, but because of the modeling assumptions here, because of the model-based approach, it's, it's kind of much more stable than stories approaches. Yeah. So stories ma approach makes no, uh, explicit modeling assumptions under the alternative. And that's actually why it leads to what I believe to be unrealistic, uh, distributions, because what it does is it subtracts the null distribution, and then whatever's left, it calls that the alternative distribution without checking that it's even a valid, a potential alternative distribution for p-values, and you know, there are restrictions on, on that. So, yeah, so I think uh, it's the multivariate case, that's not true. For one, you know, it might still give not completely crazy results, but really to get the benefits. In both cases, you'll get much more benefit from lots of tests. But if you've only got one test, you'll still get, I believe, a not ridiculous answer if you apply the method. That's, I think that's the best you can hope for for, for one test, that it's not ridiculous. Okay, there's a question by Mike about using structure or basically using, in some sense, using side, in, side information about the hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah, you could try. <laughs> I'm not going to rush to do that. Um, I think that 
I think people don't know as much as they think they know. So I'm a bit like, I'd rather do it unsupervised and then have a warm glow inside when I see things that make sense popping out. Um, I mean, could more, you, you could agree lazy, agree. <laughs> because it's you a know. lot more difficult to think about how to do that. But, yeah. but yes, you could. I, I, I don't know that. So the, where it's uh, something that's maybe more on my agenda would be to have covariates on each snip on each test to try to distinguish that you know maybe the maybe the snips that are near the transcription start site show more sharing across tissues and ones which are further away which might be an enhancers maybe are more tissue specific and trying to incorporate that kind of information is it's a similar idea but slightly different I, i'm i'm more keen on that idea although it's still it's still hard okay um, I'm getting that yes, great. Wouldn't you gain more by doing a completely Bayesian analysis and using MCMC to give the posterior that incorporates all the complexities of the pipeline? Um, well, I doubt it, but um, yeah, that's my, that my bad is it, it's not worth it. Um, so when, so for maybe using mcmc versus doing the for the, these are two different kind of i guess I, okay so i may have in, may have misinterpreted the question because um because there are two different things that could you could ask one is like doing a full analysis that for example takes account of the logistic link you know, that doesn't take the beta hats and the standard errors, but tries to model everything, the raw data that led to these beta hats and standard errors. So that's one part you could have been asking about. And then the other part is the fact that we're doing empirical Bayes rather than something fully Bayes. So Susan looks like she's been invited on. So yeah, can you tell me what you meant? I meant by, aren't you a Bayesian? <laughs> yes. Well, it's empirical base. <laughs> empirical base is a heresy. Yes, yes. I've heard that. I think I completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Lindley said there's nothing less Bayesian than empirical Bayesian. Yeah. And I agree with Lindley on a lot of things, but on that, I completely disagree. <laughs> okay, but I still think that, you know, being coherent but, uh, with regards, I think you'd gain a lot more in when you were saying about the complexity, being able to put priors on more things. Well, okay, so what, in my opinion, what the uh, completely bay quote, completely Bayes approach would do would be to try to integrate out over uncertainty in G. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. We're getting a point estimate for G. Yeah. And a, bay a fully Bayesian approach would try to take account of that uncertainty yeah. in G. And I think that in the, uh, you know, in the most, uh, in most settings that the uncertainty in G is not the main issue. Um, I mean, the multi mixture of multivariate normals assumption is probably a, probably more of an issue, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which would, you, know, you still have to make an assumption like that along those lines to do the fully Bayes thing. And um yeah we've got a lot of tests so so the exception would be when you don't have a lot of tests or you have a lot of tests but they're mostly null mm -hmm. and it's only a small number that uh and so then you know our, we'd have a point estimate of g that would be mostly null that's okay but then the bit that's non-null there'd actually be a lot of uncertainty about that and we wouldn't be fully incorporating that in our analysis okay. um yeah right thank you thanks you bet. Nice to see you, Susan. It's very good. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs> I wish we could party. <laughs> yes, wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> right. We're all isolated in our little... <laughs> yeah, we have to have a party, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone get their uh, post-talk uh, right. post uh, drink and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a question from Casper about... Yeah. Um, 
I guess batch effect. And sort of data yeah. quality control. Um, so honestly, I I don't I don't know. I mean, I ha we have worried about this. Um, there, so they they're certainly. I, I'm not sure about the process separately and differently. The, the subset of donors that gave there were some donors that gave brains, um, and those donors are not a random sample of all donors. That's certainly true. Yeah, I mean, bottom line is is a good question, and I don't know the answer. I don't know how to distinguish. So I'm operating under the assumption it's it's at least somewhat real and not entirely a batch effect. But and I think that the I think that the uh, signal we see of sharing of cere cerebellar tissues compared with others, the excess sharing we see there, suggests that there's some you know, biology that we're extracting here and not just batch effects. But but I acknowledge that um, you know some batch effects could that, that could overstate the sharing. Yeah. But in a way, this is also OK. I mean, I like your actually the point about modularity, because in some sense, dealing with the model, dealing with batch effects in the data, one could put on top of the procedure, sort of put in there somewhere yeah. and still have yes. the modularity concept applied. Absolutely, yes, yes. So, this there, is, so that, that kind of thing raises the question of um, you know how should we deal with how should we deal with batch effects in a modular way, right? So one approach would be to correct for batch effects, have some procedure part of the pipeline that corrects for batch effects and then does the next step, assuming they've been removed. Another would be to do some kind of estimation of latent variables, which is a, how a lot of the batch effect, and then pass those latent variables in as a very as a which I think would be the better way to deal with them here, because I think how you correct for batch effects depends on the signal you're looking for. Like I think that you really want to have that. So there's some things you have to do jointly. This go and it also goes back to Susan's right question: is what should we do jointly, and what can we get away with doing one at a time? And I'm inclined to think, although I don't have strong supporting evidence, I'm inclined to think that batch effects might be something where it's better to you know, the, where the mo right level of modularity is to have some kind of method for estimating latent variables and then mm -hmm. pass that into the downstream. And that maybe does have to be done jointly. The correction mm -hmm. maybe does have to be done jointly with the effect size estimation. Uh, you had another question here, what, Wolfgang. To what extent is this a matter of non nomenclature? It's somewhat philosophical that, like, yeah. I mean, aren't you sort of, just turning four discoveries into two discoveries by labeling something with a very small effect size and alternative, even though somebody else. Yeah, so I should maybe, matter. you know, in that picture, um, the the uh, the the decomposition doesn't lead to z-scores being near zero being labeled necessarily uh, true discoveries that because it just means that there's at zero, there's an appreciable, you know, that we're trying to partition the Z scores into a group into. Okay. We're trying to say how many of them are from the null and how many of them are from the alternative, but we can't tell you which ones are from the null and which ones are from the alternative. But mm -hmm. um, it is true that if the, when the signal gets high enough, strong enough, what happens is that the method is, estimates there are no nulls and that everything's alternative. At which point, if you ask what's the FDR for something, even with a z-score of zero, um, it says, well, it's alternative. Because, and this gets also gets back maybe to Susan's comment. Because we've estimated everything's alternative and it's a point estimate, um, you know, there's no uncertainty in that. And mm -hmm. it decides everything's alternative and everything's significant, which makes a lot of people very unhappy which I can't understand because weren't they looking for significant things? But okay, so no, being serious, everything's significant and that's no, no use. Um, and so the answer we give to that is you should look effect sizes again. And in particular, if you ask a different question, 
if you ask the question, is the effect size positive or negative, or just can we tell the sign of the effect? Instead of asking whether it's zero or not, we ask, can you tell the sign of the effect? Um, and the the answer for something with a z score of zero will be no. You know, even or even a z score of a half will typically be no. You can't tell the size sign of the effect. Even if it <laughs> if it's non-null, because everything's non-null, you can't tell a sign. So so this is uh, yeah, we call that the false sign rate instead of the mm -hmm. false discovery rate, and it's more robust to modeling assumptions because it's much more robust to the question of whether things are ze exactly zero or just very close to zero. So you're right, you can't tell, you know, data can't tell the difference between very, very close to zero and exactly zero. And so asking the question, is it zero or not, is is not a good idea, is, is kind of the idea. So at least if you, so we, we prefer the question, can you tell the sign? And that's in my uh, 2017 paper. And it, uh, I should say that we're not the first to point that out. I mean, Tukey is, uh, has a famous quote related to that. And uh, Andrew Gelman has a lot of work in his co-authors. Mm -hmm. I think it's Jennifer Hill uh, have, uh, and he, they have type S errors, which is very closely connected to what we're calling the false sign rate. All right, so I think time's running out, Matt. Thank you very much again. You bet, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for all the questions. It's been really fun. Thank you very much. And then everybody else, see you again soon in the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Enjoy England and your holidays. Thank you.